Run along, oh. little puppies. Oh. <laughs> he just, just shifted just, the whole light fixture over like he's just <laughs> half a foot. <laughs> just, just, just by breathing. Awesome. <laughs> Excellent. It's pure power. Here's a good boy. Good boy, hero. All right. Um, we should, boy. we should be live. You're a good boy. Um, about now. So uh, that's it's probably about time to introduce the show. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to our live show. Uh, yeah. This is Awesome Hardware, episode number 141. Uh, this is actually the second half of episode 141. So 141A was already streamed for about an hour, give or take, on Kyle's channel, uh, Bitwit. Was. So link to that is in the description if you missed it. If you're watching live, thanks for joining us. Thanks for being here. I just gave them both of my dogs... <laughs> Treats? Dental treats. You might hear them chomping away down there. Going at it. Um, but this is a live stream about technology, computers, and that kind of thing. We stream every Tuesday evening at 5.30 p.m. Pacific to twitch.tv slash awesomehardware, where we stream the whole thing, and then we stream half to each of our YouTube channels. Again, this is the second half of uh, 141 on my channel, Paul's Hardware. Uh, thank you to all of you who have helped support our channels over the years and if you'd like to continue to do so and want to get yourself some merchandise check out our stores paulshardware.net is mine uh, just added some new stuff including metallic silver it's like shiny it's like kind of shiny printing this it goes on shimmery. there uh, and there's these lightweight nice. hoodies so these these hoodies are, are lightweight so they're kind of like a <clears throat> they're kind of like a heavy t-shirt um uh, uh as far as the, the fabric goes uh, yeah. we ha I had a demo sent over here, so um, they're not as warm, but if you're looking for something for spring or summer or something like that, uh, or depending where you live, check them out. They're pretty nice. Uh, also got uh, the metallic silver on normal t-shirts, as well as all the other merch that uh, has been available for some time, so uh, check it out. Also over on Kyle's store, bitwit.tech slash store, uh, you can find also very, very nice merchandise. So if you buy stuff during the show, we will... Shout out your name and Johnson to you at the end of the show. So thanks to all you guys who have done that. This is true. Um, also, a brief uh, warning to any of you guys who might be sensitive to adult language. We drink a beer and occasionally use adult language on the show. So uh, it's meant for people who are uh, old enough to, to be responsible with drinking and old enough to be mature about the things they're discussing and appreciate it. Dogs. Dogs barking. Wow, that's actually really good timing for the for the dental treats because that totally. It was. They're eating dental treats. That's why they didn't freak out. Oh, it was. I somehow timed that perfectly. It was amazing. Wow. I was confused by nobody was. Yeah, I, I. She should call you like two minutes before she rolls in, like every. Two yeah, minutes, and be yeah. like, hey, feed them. Send out the dental, the dental treats because. Usually when oh. my wife arrives home, the dogs go bar go barking off to the door. So, wow, all right, well, that worked out. It's like in zombie movies when they like just throw like a you know dead piece of flesh out, yeah. and the zombies are totally distracted. They don't even like pay them any mind or anything. That's you just my dogs, dogs are very similar to flesh eating zombies. That's why humans are better. Yep, they're smarter. Okay, moving on. Uh, whoa, sorry. Whoa. Oh, oh, hero, no, oh, hero, whoa, whoa. It always makes me nervous when I see him charging. No, when he moves me. fast, it's like, oh my god. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of force just coming towards you. Hero is a, uh, he's about 100 pounds now. He's actually over 100 pounds now. He's, he's a pit bull mastiff. He's just pure muscle. <laughs> he's, just, he's just pure muscle. Like someone just extracted, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger's abs yeah, he, and turned it into a dog. He's got a big old dome. Like his head is just massive and it's like um, a helmet. It's he, like a hard hat. He can be intimidating when he comes running along at you. All right, let's uh, see. This is wrong. This is totally wrong. I gotta change this. Hold on. Oh, there it is. Big let's, dog. Let's do our first. That's a big dog. That's a big fucking dog. Why didn't that? Why didn't that work? Oh, there it goes. Uh, our first uh, segment for today is cryptocurrency, and uh, we're gonna talk about cryptocurrency just a little bit. And the first story is from The Verge. All the stories we're talking about today, by the way, are linked in the video's description down below, so uh, check it out if you want to read more. Coinbase, though, which is a very popular and oft-used uh, cryptocurrency trading website and repository, has told 13,000 users uh, that their data will be sent to the IRS soon. So if you are a Coinbase uh, member or user, 
then you might already be aware of this, but um, this actually goes back to a no November 2016 court order um, from the IRS, or originated from the IRS, uh, which is handed out to 13,000 customers, or basically directed the IRS, or, or directed Coinbase to give the IRS 13,000 customers data. Um, and it will be complied with, according to this article, within 21 days. And this article uh, was posted yesterday, so 20 days left, I suppose. Hmm. Uh, anyone who bought Bitcoin, or more specifically, completed transactions totaling more than $20,000 through their accounts in a single year. So $20,000 worth of transactions within a single year qualifies you for a frequent enough user of Coinbase to have been reported to the IRS hmm. um, through this court order. Um, again, the dates are from 2013 to 2015, and they're specifically the IRS looking after or looking for people who are evading cryptocurrency taxes because uh -huh. uh, depending on like how much money you've made from cryptocurrency and when it happens and whether you bought crypto and then it, it increased in value and you sold it or whether you mined it, there's different uh, tax requirements for claiming that money that you made. Because if you made money, then you're supposed to tell cool. the IRS you made that money and possibly pay taxes on it mm -hmm. if you live in the U.S., right. of course. Um, if you are not sure about this and you're like, maybe I did use that. Um, well, first off, if you if you use Coinbase, you should have gotten an email by now. They've emailed people just recently, letting them know that they will be sending their information to the IRS. And if they do that, then you're probably going to want to make sure that you've claimed uh, any money you've made through Coinbase. Or, I mean, you should claim money that you make in general. You should right. go by the laws that the IRS has for... Um, paying taxes and stuff and uh but what i wanted to say was uh the article linked in the description uh has a link down at the bottom which is uh talking about in 2018 it seems like there's more of a push for this because crypto has become more popular but this link where it says it's a good time to be extra careful about compliance goes to a secondary article on the verge about how to file your income taxes on bitcoin in 2018 and this has a little bit more data about documenting stuff and where to report Bitcoin income and, and you know, how you actually got it depending, how's, how it's taxed depending on the source of the of, of the profit and that kind of thing. So Right. There Seems some, like there needs to be a lot of update videos now to all of the how long does it take to make your money back or, you know, gain a profit from, from Bitcoin, from, from crypto mining. Um, I feel like a lot of those videos are not taking taxes into account. That's true. So that's that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, hey, it's money, it should be taxed uh, yeah, in America. It's, it's something akin to capital gains tax for in some situations, but again, it depends on how you made money from cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. And more details on that article. All right, interesting. Uh, John Petty Research has just, uh, as of yesterday, posted a uh, report on. Q4, as well as uh, some numbers on, on 2017, uh, JPR does uh, analysis of um, technology and uh, market sales, that kind of thing. Excuse me. Um, year to date, I'm sorry, year to year, total GPU si uh, shipments decreased 4.8%. So 4.8% down graphics card sales. Desktop graphics are down 2%. 2%. Notebook uh, graphics sales down 7%. Huh. What do you think of that, Kyle? I'm kind of not surprised at all by the desktop graphics. A little dip in desktop, more so mm. in notebooks. Well, that's but, also not surprising. But it is interesting to see that notebooks have decreased. But I feel like it's it's sort of like acclimated. Like we've kind of plateaued where everyone's got a freaking notebook at this point, And there haven't been any huge strides in notebook well, technology you're, you're 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 looking at a marketplace where the the available graphics like the the mobile graphics the graphics cards that you might get in a, in a notebook that would have a discrete graphics card in it have been out for a while so you're looking at maybe a little bit of saturation to some degree where people who might have invested in a gaming laptop maybe they're already satisfied with what with what they have because there hasn't been any 
major advancements or launches right. in that space. So that's maybe something. Which also means that vendors aren't advertising their older products as much. You know what I mean? Like their marketing spend is probably not as high now when they're on the tail end of the the current generation of technology that they're on and they're probably gearing up for the next wave and they're going to push that even harder. So I feel like maybe they're just not, you know, but that, that also might have something to do with it. The fact that we're not being marketed um, these newer current gen uh, CPUs and GPUs that have been out for a year or more now. So um, that's possible. It's not too surprising. I think we're just, I, I think we're just kind of in a lull overall. PC market, desktop market, desktop or mobile, we're kind of in a lull in between uh, the sort of... Uh, you know, transitionary period between generations. And if there's a lull in desktop sales, it might be expected to uh, continue this year. But more on that in a minute. Uh, to bring this back around to why we're including this in the cryptocurrency section, there's a, a, an article on WCCF Tech about the JPR article, which has a little bit more analysis. Uh, Hassan did this article. And... Um, Three million graphics cards. This, I found this interesting in the JPR article, and I, I tried to read through this to find, see if there is any indication as to how they determined this. But they very specifically say over three million add-in boards were sold to cryptocurrency miners, worth seven hundred and seventy-six million dollars in 2017. AMD was the primary benefactor of these sales. They have some numbers to back it up here. I don't know how they determine that a GPU that was sold was sold specifically to a cryptocurrency miner. I'm not right. sure how they're saying, how they're, they're, they're separating that. I, that, I mean, hmm. I thought the article might have something. It didn't seem to, to specify that. I, I mean, JPR is pretty well respected, so I have to assume it's true. But I just, I'd be interested to see how they determine that this sale went to a crypto miner versus this sale that went to Maybe a anyone gamer. buying over two GPUs at a time. Yeah, they might be looking at bulk sales or that kind of thing. Uh, uh, maybe companies that, that are selling direct directors. Uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to say. Cause but, um, I feel like most people, most miners, or most people who are into mining, who are trying to get their foot into mining, wouldn't just buy one or two G, maybe two, but wouldn't just buy one GPU. If they're going through all yeah. that trouble, they're probably trying to rack up, you know, a couple graphics cards to get the highest hash rate or whatever it is. When I went maybe to, that's how they're figuring it out. When I went to Fry's um, a week week or two ago, and I was walking in, and a dude was walking out. Did I mention this last week? I feel like I no, I didn't. I don't think so. A dude was walking out with a shopping cart with a bunch of graphics cards in it. And I looked. You punched him in the face. I went, I went, ran up and I punched him. No, I in the balls. I no, like at first I was kind of like bemused by it, right? And I looked at it. Uh, I didn't like go up close to it, but I'm pretty sure they were 1070s. I'm pretty sure. Swanky. They were GTX 1070s in it. But then we went in, because we were going in to, to buy a computer case. But I wanted to look at the graphics cards just to see, like you know, the, the, the empty room. shelves or if they had anything or whatever. And there was nothing. There were certainly no 1070s or 1070 Ti's. Hmm. So I was like, how did that guy just walk out with a shopping cart full of right. 1070s? Maybe he and my mind reserve. started going with speculation of, like, did he somehow know when they were going to get a shipment in? Maybe. Was he just lucky to be there and be like, oh, my gosh, they actually have these in stock? They were selling for well over MSRP. The 1070s that were that had the stickers there were selling, I think, for seven or 800 bucks each. Wow. So he certainly bought them like, at that price. What? But that's so. Uh, yeah, so I, I I don't know. I, I feel how many like, did he have in his car? Like five it or like, like fifteen? There were probably somewhere like eight or eight or ten. I wow. mean, it was definitely a stack of graphics wow. cards that were in there. The only other GPUs that were in stock were ten thirties that were there. That's but so crazy. Anyway, moving on though, uh, there is blah, blah blah blah. There was a couple other things I was going to mention about this. AMD market share has increased uh, when it comes to GPUs. In Q3, it was at 13%. In Q4, Q4 it jumped up to 14.2%, which is an 8.1% increase. So uh, despite the... Like, I don't feel like many gamers have actually got their hands on, like, a Vega 56 or a Vega 64, but according to this, market share has increased for them. Um... There was one like little tidbit in here that, that I felt like was kind of a kind of a 
a bit of hope, perhaps, a quote from the article that said, We expect demand to slacken from miners as margins drop in response to increasing utility costs and supply and demand forces that drive up AIB prices. So that specifically saying is uh, increasing utility costs. I don't know how much what that... What do they mean by that? Well, how much, like, you, if you're mining, then that's using up electricity, and you, your electricity has to come from somewhere. So you well, have to pay that. your utility, utility bills. Um, but, that, but then there's also the, like, mining difficulty that increases over time, depending on what, what cryptocurrency you're talking about and that kind of thing. So I'm not sure if things. So they don't mean, like, you know, that the rates for electricity are going up. They just mean if you start mining, you'll be paying more in, for your electricity bill every month, which I think most miners understand uh, yeah. right? already. Like, like, yeah, we get it. We know we're going to be paying more for electricity every month. So I don't know how that's like that's going to like cause people to stop mining. I don't. Isn't that just that, that's like common knowledge? It just comes with the territory that. I'm going to pay more for my electricity costs. If, if, like, if I were to look forward to demand slacking for graphics cards from miners, it would probably be because difficulty of mining is it goes up over time. So yeah. if you're not making as much money from the graphics cards that you have employed in your mining rig, then your interest in buying more is probably going to wane. Yeah. And at a certain point... You might reach a threshold where you start reducing the number of cards you're mining with if it doesn't make sense when it comes to how much you're paying for your, your, your utility costs. But there's also this possibility of like other like new cryptocurrencies come about all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Like Ethereum obviously is one of the most popular or most effective uh, currencies that's mined with graphics cards right now. But new cryptocurrencies that come about that gain in popularity and value might suddenly introduce a new, you know, an, a, a, a different uh, avenue to direct your your uh, mining uh, power down. Uh, I'm, I'm using the wrong term. If you can switch over to a different cryptocurrency that suddenly your mining power is more effective at, then, you know, you're not, mm -hmm. you're not suffering that drop off. Yeah. I guess is what I'm Something trying to say. Something that's more efficient for your, your setup or whatever. Yes. Okay. Okay. I got you. Anyway, uh, point being, lots of graphics cards were purchased by cryptocurrency miners in 2017, and this article is a bit uh, direct proof of that. Probably uh, a lot of us assume that anyway, given current prices and whatnot. All right, uh, if you are not into cryptocurrency mining at all, you might still have done some crypto mining, uh, and that might have just happened by going to a website that has an Ooh. ad service that has an ad that gets fed, that gets uh, served to you that uh, loads up say uh, Java script or something that uh, initiates uh, a mining uh, on your CPU using your extra CPU cycles. Uh, this has been happening for a little while now and it's become more prevalent but uh, in some ways also actually if you go all the way to the bottom of this article they have a little bit I found this interesting. Like, how much do people actually make from having a website with ads that get served on it that do crypto mining? Uh, and there is a follow-up post uh, on ARS Technica that is linked here uh, from back in September where they did a very small site experimenting with mining and uh, 1,000 visits per day and a 55-second average, and the site made 36 cents per day, which was four to five times less than it made running regular ads. Mm. So, obviously... It's probably going to depend on your traffic and everything, whether it would make sense for you to even engage in this type of activity if you were the, you know, if you run a website or something like that. But There's so many ethical the point is, dilemmas yeah, with that, too. And, and for, most, for most of us, uh, I, I personally get kind of irritated at something like this. Like, I don't want some random website I go to to suddenly have access to the hardware, hardware. capabilities yeah. of, of the system that I've built. Right. Like, right? And I mm. certainly don't want suddenly it to be using more power that I have to pay for exactly. to mine for somebody else. Like, that's right. pretty crappy, too. So, yeah. 
Um, obviously, this, among other crappy advertising techniques, is the reason why ad blockers have um, become very popular. We use ad blockers as we're showing you guys a lot of the websites that we visit during the live show, primarily to prevent any sort of redirects, ads, that kind of thing from popping up. However, uh, we, uh, or at least I could say I, and I think Kyle does too, if you go to a website commonly uh, or, or a YouTube channel or something like that, remember that a lot of the internet is still ad supported. A lot of the free content that's available on the internet still relies on, on ads. So whitelisting is uh, something that you can do to uh, give a little bit back to the websites and uh, uh, content sources that you go to without um, hopefully uh, making yourself susceptible to this type of thing. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah. before I move on, I think we should open these beers. Ah! Second wind, here yeah. we come. We've, oh, uh, these are so good. These beers are so good. These are. This is Left Hand Brewing. Left Hand Brewing. Company. Milk Stout Nitro. Um, I picked these up at Total Wine the other day. Can oh, I get that bottle I, open? I didn't open yours, so it's all good. <laughs> uh, no, it's cool. Okay. I'll just look at the bottle while you drink. Okay. Um, these are nitro. I've never had a bottled nitro before until this, but they're, they're delicious. Mm. Cheers. Been working on our pouring techniques. Yep. Really good at pouring now. So satisfying. And that's how you pour a beer. That's how you should pour every beer. <laughs> every beer, pour that way. No. Um, these specifically are, are meant to be poured hard, which means straight down. That's a hard pour. Just to en engage that nitro effect, and you can sort of see it. Uh, it's perfectly fine. It's doing its thing. Giving us a nice level of head there. Well. I'm sure a lot of you guys freaked out right there, but... Uh, after, it, everything's, after the, everything's cool. After the it's difficulties that I had, was that last week or the? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Occasionally we have we have a, a challenging time pouring beer on the show, but anyway, let's move on. Cheers. Uh, oh yeah, cheers. Cheers, guys. So. Oh, it's if a website that you're visiting is using your CPU to mine while you browse, uh, that sucks, and you might employ an ad blocker to prevent it. However, some miners are employing a trick to um, to circumvent that, and it was actually first popularized by botnet software uh, to bypass ad blocking. Basically, it's using domain name algorithms, uh, which is software-derived means for creating a nearly unlimited number of unique domain names. Ad blockers often rely on blocking an ad source domain, but this circumvents that by creating a virtually unlimited number of randomly created domains that the ad can then uh, source uh, that the ad can be sourced from, uh, which might not be blocked or listed in the list of blocked domains by your ad blocker. Um, the research reference in the article was done by NetLab 360 researcher Zhang Zifeng, who said that uh, some of these uh, domain name algorithm based crypto mining uh, ads have been in operation since mid 2017. He said the number of people being redirected to the algorithmically generated domains appears to be significant. One do domain, which is basically a bunch of random letters.com, was uh, number 1,999 in the Alexa website ranking, so managed to get within the top 2,000. Uh, websites visited by Alexa simply by being a randomly redirected hmm. ad uh, probably being served to who knows what websites. Um, the algorithmically generated domain eventually calls coin, coinhive.com coin-hive.com uh, and depending on what software you're using it may or may not actually be able to block that. They specifically quote from Jerome Segura, who's the lead malware uh, analyst from for Malwarebytes. I've used Malwarebytes mm -hmm. before. I, I think it's pretty solid software. He said for Malwarebytes users, it doesn't matter because we can block either the ad network or the CoinHive call. So either way, they're able to block it. Um, but in any case, uh, there's a little bit more detail in the article if you guys want to go into it. Sketchy. Like I said, it follows up with some of the stuff like how much do pe how much are how much are people who are engaging in this activity actually profiting in it? Yeah. It doesn't necessarily seem like it's that much simply because people don't necessarily sit on websites that long. Right. But obviously people are trying it and um it does seem to be 
uh, unethical at best. So um, it's certainly something that uh, people should be aware of. Try to block. Oh God. This is what you sound like, Paul. How did that even click on? Oh, it did that again. Uh, your 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 rocket tie on. Oh, going oh no, that's a, that's not the tie on. That's the, the uh, nith. And nith. And this son of a nith. Joe Joe. So Joe used this mouse, he and he up. has the rocket software, and he like reprograms everything. Ah. So now, editing. like, I was using this mouse, and I had one I had one profile set up on it that it just always used, and I was like, fine. And now it has like. And now, all, by the color. All right, it's fine. and now all 15 buttons open up Pornhub. Like, just no matter what you do, left and right click. Pretty much. Just open up Pornhub. But there's certain times, so like there, DPI? I could tell because the color changed. Like, I did, I scrolled the mouse, the, I scrolled the wheel, and it changed the volume. What? That's what, that's what just happened. Wow. There. From mute to. I feel like I usually need more. scroll way more than I need volume. That still did it. Especially because I have a volume again. knob on my keyboard. What? What is going on? So that just instantly takes ah. your volume to a hundred, or just unmutes. What is going on? Yeah, it's still, it's still, it's still volume. So just scroll all the way down. <laughs> scroll down the device. Just scroll all the way down. Weird. How does he scroll then? That drives me crazy. How does he scroll? All right. I seem How to does fix Joe? It, it seems to have fixed scroll. It. It's like if I accidentally hit the profile change button, it messes with everything. Next time right. I'm over at Joe's my house, rocket, I'm like, hey, go to this web page. Myth is basically... Next time I'm at Joe's house, I'm like, go to this web page. All right, now scroll down. <laughs> I just want to see what it does. It's basically possessed. It just uses arrow keys. All right. Let's move on. Uh, right, one more story on. here for Netwatch. Uh, wait, no, we're not to Netwatch yet. Wait, now we're at Netwatch. Mm -hmm. Let's... Damn it. What are we doing? Netwatch. <laughs> Where'd it go? AT&T. Mm. I'm talking I, about I, I gotta update this. I, I thought I thought I was ready. I wasn't. It's all good. Net watch, net watch. watch. There it is. Net watch, net watch. He scrolls just with the wait while the uh, while the hard drive wakes up that has the image stored on it. There it is. Net watch. Alrighty. Time for net watch. Where we talk about the internet and stuff. Whee! So, uh, all right. First off, uh, net neutrality. We've talked a lot about the uh, fight for it in the U.S. That's uh, gone on over the past amount of time and stuff. And uh, in late 2017, uh, we lost, and 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 the FCC was like, "Hey, we don't care what anyone says. We're gonna get rid of net neutrality." So, um. Lots of internet service providers, when this happened or when the debate was ongoing about it, um, made some pretty, you know, like publicly flowery statements, such as uh, AT&T CEO Randall Stevenson saying last year, we don't block websites, we don't censor online content, and we don't throttle, discriminate, or degrade network performance based on content, period. Just based on money. Um, and they, they, then their, their Twitter tweeted stuff like that and all that kind of stuff. But um, just to show everyone that that was all, uh, that was all bullshit, basically, and that um, pretty quickly, within a relatively short period of time afterwards, they're going to actually start doing things that violate net neutrality or the, 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 what net neutrality actually is. Uh, AT&T has started to roll out internet fast lanes in the form of uh, zero-rated content. So on Friday, just this last week, uh, four days ago, AT&T sent texts to customers explaining how they are expanding their sponsored data program to allow other companies to sponsor data. Sponsored data plans mean that the companies pay AT&T to have their content streamed to AT&T customers' devices without hitting against their data plans. Uh, right now, though, there's only three services using AT&T's sponsored data program. Those happen to be DirecTV, UVerse, and Fullscreen, uh, which are all services that are owned by AT&T. So hmm. when it comes to discriminating against content, uh, pretty much... The base definition of that, if some content that you can access via your data plan on your cell phone or whatever you have it counts against your data cap and others does not. That's discrimination. That's discriminating against Holy the data shit. and the content there. So whereas wow. zero rating has maintained some popularity and there's different ways to implement it, 
This mouse is just freaking out. I just gotta, I just gotta get rid of that. Kill the mouse. I don't know what's wrong with it. Um, this this certainly is is a violation of that in AT and T, um, proving pretty quickly that they do intend to um, have uh, to have treat sites and data differently. To, to treat sites and data differently, yes. Yeah. Um, when you attempt to connect to it to uh, download or that's really fucking shitty. Yeah. Wow. Damn it. Now, does this apply to home internet, or is this, or are we only talking about mobile here? Hold on. Wow, I, this mouse is terrible now. Your nith is. I need. I need to read. Nith is dying. Yeah, my nith is. Can you hand me the um? You want the M5, M65? Oh yeah, that works. Try that. This this I like this mouse. I do too. It's a Corsair M65. That's okay. a good one. Um, what was I talking about? Uh. Net neutrality. Net neutrality, AT&T. AT&T yes. and um, or... There are two major consequences to this. One uh, is that the FTC... No, no, no. I, 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 I scrolled down. I'm on the next story. <laughs> <laughs> that's horrible. Start reading bullets from the next uh, story. That's horrible. All right. Um, no, that, that's all I had to say about that. Um, okay. AT&T is, is, is already starting to do uh, prioritized service for certain data that you might access. So aren't aren't we still waiting on like lawsuits to follow through? Like aren't people suing like Yes, like, we are. Like to, the, to like, some degree. That um, neutrality hasn't officially died yet, has it? Well, actually just uh, a few days ago in that neutrality the um like so it was in uh was it November, late November, early December when the uh F C C mm -hmm. actually made their decision. Um, it was actually applied like two or three days ago or four within the past week. Mm -hmm. But there's a 60 day period right now where um, there's a chance for a congressional review to possibly. Mm -hmm. um, that it could possibly be reversed by congressional review. So, does that but, mean within these next 60 days, net neutrality is dead, but it could potentially come back? Yeah, we're, but but you're getting we're getting ahead of ourselves. Oh, okay. Before we talk about that, let's talk about this. Uh, AT and T has lost a years long quest to cripple FTC authority over telecoms. And this story, I wanted to talk about a little bit because there's some nuance to this. There are two sides to it. And whereas you might at first read this story and uh, read that the FTC uh, is very properly holding AT&T accountable for uh, what they did several years back. They promised unlimited data to wireless customers. They had contracts that said, you get unlimited data, you wireless customers. However, once those wireless customers crossed a certain threshold, uh, which was not disclosed to them, uh, AT&T throttled their speeds right. by as much as 90%. So yeah. when you're told like, hey, this plan that you're signing up for has unlimited data or whatever, and then unbeknownst to you, there is some threshold that you can cross where suddenly your data speeds go to crap. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of crappy. AT&T has been fighting this for a while. Uh, they claimed that the FTC has no jurisdiction over the company because the FTC is specifically barred from regulating common carriers. This is also an inter interesting case because it initially started in 2014, which, which was before... Um, the FCC started uh, uh, classified internet service providers as common and carriers in 2015. From 2015 to 2017, they're common carriers, Title II. Now they've been uh, switched back to Title I, mm -hmm. and net neutrality is in effect. So this it, it kind of straddles that on both sides, which I don't know how much that affects the actual decision-making going on, but... Um, uh, U.S. law does prevent the FCC from regulating common carriers. FTC. But the FTC, yes. I'm sorry. The FTC, Federal Trade Commission. Uh, but the immunity from FTC regulations applies only to the extent that a common carrier was engaging in common carrier services. So, as I was starting to say before, there are two major consequences to this. Uh, the first is that the FTC's law to, lawsuit against AT&T can proceed. So the FTC is holding AT&T accountable for what they said they would do for customers in this case, which is good. That potentially allows the FTC to get refunds for AT&T customers who, whose mobile internet plans were throttled. 
So if you were one of those customers and you know maybe you'll get a refund or a credit or something like that, we'll see how that goes. Second part though, is that th this decision affirms the FTC's authority to regulate broadband providers even when those providers offer separate common carrier services such as landline or mobile phone service. So AT&T provides some services that are classified as common carriers, such mm -hmm. as a direct phone service to your house. They are also providing service that is not classified as common carrier, right. such as a AT&T, uh, you know, cell, plan cell phone or plan, yeah. or, or that kind of thing, or an internet, right. or an internet plan. Yeah. So because they straddle both, this affirms the, that the FCC can regulate them right. within that niche of what it's able to <clears throat> sure. regulate. However... Before anyone gets too happy about the FCC do, doing their job here, please bear in mind that FCC Chairman Ajit Pai, who you're probably familiar with if you watch the show, applauded this court ruling, which uh, might make you think twice about it, depending on your opinions of Ajit Pai. What he said about this is kind of deceptive, though. What he said is that what, what he wants, what Ajit Pai has said before when, when it comes to the FCC and them being like, hey... We don't need to have rules that keep internet service providers from enforcing net neutrality. We'll just leave that to them. You know, let the let the market handle that. Fair. Yeah. Um, they would say that the FTC is in a position to do something about this. However, the FTC is more of a, a, a as as the way that they're structured. They don't have any specific net neutrality rules. The FTC does not have any guidelines that say, here's how these internet service providers should act. Right. What the FTC, the FTC can do is if the internet service provider promises you something, if they say that we're going to give you this unlimited internet and we're not going to throttle you, or they provide a contract to you that says net neutrality is very important to us and we're always going to uphold it or whatever then the FTC has the authority to enforce it after right. the fact. And please bear in mind that mm. this is coming through right now when the actual transgressions occurred in 2014, three, four years ago. So right. you're talking about enforcing after the fact versus creating rules that prevent something from happening right. in the first place. Yeah, the FTC, so, FTC can't force the ISPs to behave a certain way, they can only make sure that they keep true to their promises of whatever the fuck they want. If they made those promises. If they made those promises, right. Which right now, and if you're signing a new contract, they may or may not make those right. promises okay. in the contract in the that final all makes or something sense. like that. So yeah. this is why if you're reading something that says, all right, this shows that the FTC should be able to handle net neutrality, that's not true. Right. Um, the FTC should be able to... Uh, hold companies accountable for promising customers uh, or, or uh, something and, and then not following through on it. But obviously this, uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, mm -hmm. I feel like I was going to say some poignant closing statement there, but... Uh, the like FTC is like a parole officer. They can't really force you to not do bad shit. They can only check up on you and... And try to see if you were keeping your promises, but there's no way for them to actually enforce it. That'd be like your, like your wife. Your wife would be the one. I don't know where I'm going with this metaphor. I've decided not to scrutinize your analogy. Nope, you're right. And just nod. It's probably probably, probably. for the best. Yeah. Okay. Let the internet decide. Moving on, though. Uh, today was classified as a net neutrality day of action. And if you are on the uh, social medias at all or Twitter, you might have seen some hashtags going around for, for net neutrality day of action. If you're not familiar with what exactly people were talking about, here's a little bit more detail on that. Now, this article from Gizmodo uh, is just right in the title talking about Democrats uh, unveiling a plan to save net neutrality or make Republicans look bad while trying. I want to take a moment to reemphasize that uh, I, I wish net neutrality wasn't being divided on party lines because honestly... It doesn't matter. I feel like yeah. there's some fundamental like, like principles that Republicans... Like t tend to cherish that that fall in line with net like what net neutrality is mm -hmm. like like that makes sense to me. So 
it doesn't I don't understand why it needs to be divided. It seems to be the Republican side of 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 Congress and the Senate that seems to be so anti net neutrality. Money. That said, that said, money's the answer to everything. Uh, you know, we can we can at least look at what's going on right now when it comes to practically speaking what the outcome is going to be. So, as mentioned, um, just recently, uh, the FCC actually engaged. They I don't, like it, there's always multiple steps to this type of thing, but they basically hit the go button on um, the uh, restoring internet freedom order, uh, which was their name for the thing that they did to kill net neutrality. They call it restoring internet freedom because they like to name things things that are completely opposite of what they actually do. Um, what happened today was uh, a, a, a bunch of Democratic lawmakers formally introduced legislation to save net neutrality via a resolution that would re reverse the Restoring Internet Freedom Order, and they're doing this through what's called the Congressional Review Act, CRA. This allows Congress to overturn agency regulations from uh, agencies such as the FCC. Um, in order to do this, they need 51 votes in the Senate. Right now they have 50, so they're looking for one more senator, one more Republican senator specifically, to decide mm -hmm. that right. net neutrality is more important than following their party line and to, uh, yeah. to, to join up with the people who are trying to, to save net neutrality. Um, all 49 members of the Democratic caucus, which includes two independents, as well as Maine Republican Senator Susan Collins, uh, are part of this group who is pushing uh, to use the Congressional Review Act to overturn the Restoring Internet Freedom Order. But all things said and all things considered, this is probably mostly um, something that's more of an act of... Uh, uh, more of a statement than something that's actually going to get anything done Changing. because uh, it would need to go through the Senate as well as the House. And in the House, they still need something like 100 um, uh, uh, members of the House to to change their mind there because in the House, there's a lot more there's, there's a lot more, more, more House members of the House than there are members of the senators. Everyone knows how the U.S. government works, right? Okay. Also, I do. Sure. Even assuming it did get past the House, Trump would need to also sign it and not veto it, and who knows what he would decide to do there. So, chances are this, as it's being put forth right now, won't go through. But it does mean that people are still pushing and trying to preserve net neutrality um, because a lot of people still think it's important. We hope that you guys have uh, learned more about net neutrality by watching this show. Uh, and if you have and you're feeling compelled to contact uh, your members of Congress, uh, whether they be members of the House or the Senate, then feel free to go ahead and do that. Um, aside from all this, though, there is still hope because there are several Internet rights groups as well as 23 state attorneys general who have sued the FCC over the passage of the Restoring Internet Freedom Order. Uh, there have been sort of ongoing accusations of uh, possible, um, uh, like 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 Ajit Pai just got a a, a donation of a, a rifle from the NRA for some random reason. He got a donation rifle. Yeah, the NRA was like, "Hey, you helped save the internet, so here's a rifle, but we can't actually show it because that would actually break the rules. But we're promising you this rifle, and when you're able to accept it, then you can accept it." Which is kind of weird. Anyway, point is, there's a lot of scrutiny going on right now. And if anything untoward has happened, or especially illegal, or especially anyone who's making decisions on the behalf of uh, a large corporation or their own personal interests versus the interests of most Americans, then we hope that it will be discovered and something will be done about it. Anyway, let's move on. Because... <sighs> It's easy to get too stuck triggering. in the mire when you're uh, so when you're veering into that territory. Let's let's talk about uh, what's news. Uh, yeah, just tech news. news. Just tech news. Just tech news in general. The and good stuff. yeah, uh, so I was originally going to include this little bit um, in the in the uh, cryptocurrency segment, but I decided not to, simply because it's I don't know. 
Give you more articles for this segment. Help me spread, yeah, help me spread everything out, really. <laughs> uh, but hardware seller Mass Drop says NVIDIA predicts draft graphics cards prices will continue to go up through the year. No! Now, this article is from PC Gamer, and it is originated from Mass Drop, and that is theoretically from NVIDIA, but you should bear in mind when you're reading about this information where it actually comes from. So, Mass Drop... If you're not familiar with Mastrap, they they sell stuff. They get a bunch of people to go in and all decide to buy a thing together, and then they're able to buy that for a lower price. But you don't get the thing immediately. It's not like you go and agree to buy that thing, and then it gets shipped to you. Usually it's like they'll have it open for a couple weeks or something like that. A bunch of people will agree to buy a thing. The more people that agree to buy that thing, the lower, new prices. Often the, will lower the price because more people are buying it. But you have to wait, like, till the drop ends, and then usually it's one to two weeks, give or take, depending mm -hmm. on, the, on everything. After that, that you actually get the product. Often it's a really cool way to buy something for cheaper than you would normally pay just standard MSRP. Right. And they've been doing stuff with graphics cards, including, like, a 1080 Ti. Now, a 1080 Ti should sell for seven to $800. So a mass drop for a 1080 Ti for 950 bucks is maybe not that exciting to you. But they're doing it nonetheless, and apparently they're still selling them. Maybe because of all those cryptocurrency miners that we talked about back in the cryptocurrency segment. Yeah. But it is important to know where this article is originating from, which is a discussion thread on the GTX 1080 Ti drop, and specifically a quote from uh, tech community lead Brad Brian Hutchins from MassDrop. So he's a MassDrop employee. But he was referring to when NVIDIA came to visit MassDrop headquarters. So there's a little bit of like hearsay involved here. But if we can assume that what NVIDIA said to Brian was accurate and that he's relaying it to us accurately, what NVIDIA was saying is that they're not expecting graphics card prices to drop anytime soon. And in fact, they're expecting increases, according to the article, through Q3. Wow. Through Q3, to me, means August, September. Yeah. Which is most of this year. Which is not good news right. for anyone who's considering buying a graphics card. Um, the causes for the current shortages, according to the quotes, are from these fancy new cell phones. Uh, the new cell phones coming up from Apple, Samsung, and others last year started using the same memory as graphics cards Apple and Samsung are willing to pay more for this memory. This has created a shortage of memory for the much smaller companies like MSI, Gigabyte, Asus, and EVGA to make graphics cards. Stop. What I just told you has a clarification here that you should keep in mind. Most cell phones, pretty much all smartphones uh, that anyone who discusses technology is currently aware of, don't use uh, GDDR5 or GDDR5X memory, the memory right. that would be used in graphics card. The uh, graphics cards, excuse me, uh, they use DDR4, DDR4L memory. Uh, GDDR5 and GDDR5X is a fast memory, but it's not necessarily geared towards efficiency, and efficiency is what you want in, in cell phones. So, so these people are lying to us. There's not necessarily a direct correlation between DDR4 and DDR4L usage with smartphones and a shortage of the graphics memory that's specifically used in graphics cards. However, the speculation of the article is that DRAM manufacturers have been shifting production from GDDR5 to these DDR4 variants in order to meet the demand of cell phone manufacturers who might be willing to pay more money for them. Now, I don't know enough about the fabrication of, 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 of memory to know if there's just some sort of switch you can flip at the fab, or it's like, oh, we're 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 cranking out the DDR the GDDR5 boss and be like oh we want we want DDR4 be like all right you know and then suddenly you're producing like I've, I'm guessing there's more complexity to, to it than that probably but there may be some viability to the uh, you know a fab being able to switch from one type to another since it is memory and there is some similarity at the base level so. All that said, um, That's this not, is, this that can't is, be the this only is crappy reason, news though. and it sucks. <laughs> like uh, the speculation is that DRAM manufacturers might be shifting their uh, 
They're, they're manufacturing from GDDR5 to GDDR4, causing shortage of GDDR5 memory and GDDR5X memory, causing the prices for those to go up, causing NVIDIA, as well as their add-in board partners to raise the base level price of their graphics cards. Right. That's on top of the increased demand of the graphics cards from cryptocurrency miners who might be buying them all up at even the lower MSRP. Anyway. Hmm. So, sorry that my first bit of news here was, was bad news. Let's move on. <laughs> Since I get, Thanks, Paul. Uh, Way to pick us PC, up. PC Gamer did uh, ask NVIDIA about it. NVIDIA said no comment. So, we, we don't know. Maybe it's all BS. Sure. That, that, that person who spoke in the article is fired now. All right. Let's talk about a rumor from WCCF Tech. Uh, and rumor, rumor, rumor. Rumor, rumor. Maybe, maybe, possibly not true. Who knows? But we'll still talk about it a little bit. Anyway, um, we talked about this a bit last week. And the basic idea is that, right, right now we have NVIDIA... Pascal based graphics cards that are on the market, the 10 series, the GTX 1080 and 1080 Ti and uh, 1070 and so forth, are based on Pascal architecture, 16 nanometer manufacturing process. However, NVIDIA has Volta, and they already have products based on Volta, like the Titan V. Volta is uh, manufactured on 12 nanometer, and Volta is also a, a new architecture, and the expectation has been that Volta will also become available in the mainstream graphics market as well. The speculation in the article and the rumor is that one, they're expecting a new graphics card launch from AMD fairly soon, specifically March 26th to 29th. From AMD? I'm, did I say AMD? NVIDIA. Yeah. My bad. Okay. <laughs> uh, they're expecting an NVIDIA launch of new graphics cards, March 26th to 29th at GTC, the GeForce Technology Conference that uh, NVIDIA holds every year, which is fairly soon. That's about a month from now. Um, but also beyond that, these are going to be what's called Ampere cards. And Ampere, we first sort of talked about a little bit last week, being the rumored code name for a new GPU architecture, which has not been previously disclosed by NVIDIA at all like there has never there are no nvidia like you'll see nvidia you know roadmaps like slides that get published at the at, at tech events that they have in that kind of thing where they say all right here's what here's what we're looking at in the future and you can see like volta on there and you can you can see pascal and volta ampere has never ac appeared on any right. official nvidia documentation so doesn't mean that it's not happening doesn't mean that's not happening and the article points out um, that uh, it has been a frequent subject of leaks and rumors. So take that for what it's worth. So this is um, what that one fan in my half of the show is asking about, right? Do you believe that new GeForce cards are coming out in the next month? Yeah. So right? the, He was talking about the Ampere. Yeah, this is Ampere very specifically. Cards. So uh, right. Ampere <clears throat> um, is... Uh, well, this is, that's actually Turing right there. So Turing and Ampere are, are the two code names that are getting tossed around right now. And the idea seems to be that there will be no consumer-based Volta GPUs. They're gonna they're gonna leapfrog Volta, and that there's gonna be a 12 nanometer Ampere uh, architecture, which maybe is a Volta variation or maybe a refinement of Volta, specifically made uh, to be good at gaming. Yeah. Um, and that's again for gaming GPUs, as well as a 12 nanometer Turing. Uh, based set of GPUs, and uh, that's crypto analyst Alan, Alan Turing right there. Um, and the Turing GPUs would be a completely new architecture that would be optimized for AI and machine learning. Um, the cards that are rumored to be launched next month would be based on GA104, GeForce Ampere 104, which would be the success for, successor to GP104, which is what like the 1080 and 1070 are based on. Um, so the GA104 would have expected performance similar to like a 1080 Ti, um, but it would be the same size as like the GP104. So it would be the small chip 
and then maybe if they continue with what they've done in the past, then you'd expect to see a GA102 at some point in the future that you would have a next-gen TI, you know, 1080 TI level card based on. But, of how, course, again, all this is speculation. How does NVIDIA or any GPU manufacturer, for that matter, hype up a GPU launch right now? Because I feel like the one thing that they had going for them for the 10 series was... We have a 1080, the GTX 1080, I still remember that launch, and they are like, we're, do we're launching it for like 499 MSRP, and everyone went buck wild. But like, I, how, do they, like how you... do they hype this up for us now when they're like, this is a cutting edge, next level, next generation graphics card, selling it for a low, low price of 999 Like, that's what the, the new 1080 is going to be. Like how how do they I'm, market that? Like I'm not sure because there's 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 the pricing that is the inflated cryptocurrency affected pricing, and then there's the more reasonable. Like there's people who are who 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 when they're selling 1070s for 400 bucks and 1080s for 600 bucks and 1080 Ti's for seven or eight hundred bucks and, and Titans for a thousand. There are people who think that that is too much money, but obviously Nvidia is able to sell them for that much. So, you know that 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 seems to be a balance in the market to some degree. Like they're 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 moving product at that price. I guess it's balanced so, because the miners think that's a great deal and the gamers think that's a shit deal, and so it averages out to like a meh. But I feel status. But I feel so. I mean, but the but the but the influence of mining is something that is, it's it's like potentially fickle. You're not sure if it's going to stay there or not. So as Nvidia is launching products later this year, I'm sure they're probably having this discussion internally as well. It's like, how do we address this to people? Do we list? A sane and reasonable MSRP that falls in line with the ones that we've done in the past when cryptocurrency wasn't a thing and wasn't factoring in on the price. But then, of course, when the products launch, they're actually going to sell for more than that. Or do we suddenly inflate our MSRPs by two or three hundred bucks because we know that's what the products are going to sell for in the current marketplace? It's I don't I like I don't know. I don't know how they're going to handle that. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't know what, I don't know what they're going to do. I mean, I hope they stick with the lower prices just because that sort of, to some degree, reinforces that this is what those products should cost. Right. Um, but who knows? Uh, yeah. Also listed in the rumors in the article, did I mention that this was sourced from uh, Tweaktown, by the way? Maybe, yeah, you might have mentioned it at all the right. beginning. Anthony posted this on Tweaktown. It was, uh, this is all sourced from some friend of Anthony's. On Tweak Ten, that's like literally where it comes from. He's like, it's like some inside scoop friend. But Anthony has lots of connections, so we'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Uh, they're supposedly going to be using Samsung's new 16 gigabit per second GDDR6 memory, so that's cool. Uh, and then, of course, we have no idea what the names are actually going to be. Uh, what's been tossed around is a GTX 2080 to follow up the GTX 1080, but it could just as easily be the GTX 1180 because they've gone, you know, 780, 9, they didn't, was there? No. 780, 980, 980, 1080. 1080, 1180, right. Or 2080, who knows? It could be a 2080, it could be 1180. 1180 sounds weird. It could be a 2070 or 1170, or they could just decide GTX we're tired of this entire naming Ooh. scheme. We're going to go with, we're going to call it the GTX 1. <laughs> Start over. Just start over with one. Like Xbox. Simplify things. <laughs> um, anyway, though, GTC starts March 26th, ends March 29th, so by the end of this month, we should hopefully have an answer one way or the other. Let's cool. move on to this little story uh, from the Mobile World Congress, which is going on right now. This is from nntech.com, and WD, Western Digital, has demoed uh, a crazy fast SD card with a PCI Express by one interface. 880 megabytes per second read speed on an wow. SD card. That is really fast. I can say, as someone who uh, records 4K video with some degree of regularity, I want this. But want see, this. even USB 3 doesn't saturate that. You'd have to get, I guess, USB 3.1 PCI. Gen 2. PCIe. Right, but then wouldn't you still have to, like, I mean... 
Hey, How would you capture the, this? Is what they're... Oh, <laughs> well, see, there's the yeah, other there, half there of the go. puzzle. There you go. There's the other half of it right there. So this was a demo that they set up at uh, Mobile World Congress, which, again, is going on right now in Barcelona, Spain, España. Uh, and, yeah, they use an M.2 to SD adapter with an SD card. So there's the SD card. There's the adapter M.2. M.2, of course, uh, pipes directly into PCIe lanes. So... That's the basic, you know, physical arrangement of it. Um, again, the uh, speeds they were they were showing off uh, as being tested at the demo with Crystal Dismark were 880 megabytes per second peak sequential reads, 430 megabytes per second peak sequential uh, writes. So uh, definitely a fall off in writes there, but still not 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 shabby at all. Uh, well within the range of a very high end SSD. Uh, which is super nice for an SD card. Uh, they used the existing UHS uh, 2 and UHS 3 pins on the SD card to construct a PCIe 3.0 by 1 interface with the system. So basically they just connected those contact points to the PCIe contact points. Uh, they used a mechanical adapter for it. Presumably they also used a uh, PCIe voltage, they used a converter to convert uh, the, the standard PCIe voltage to be compatible with the SD card. Uh, WD said they have no immediate product based on this. Uh, they just wanted to do a proof of concept. Hmm. Uh, and this falls in line with the SD Card Association calling on the industry to adopt a PCIe, uh, adopt PCIe as a standard interface uh, and support development of a complete SD PCIe standard. Hmm. Key features would include uh, using existing form factors, so it's not like you'd have a different si shape or size of SD card or anything like that. Sure. You'd be using existing tooling and that kind of thing. Uh, it would use the PCI inter PCIe e interface with the NVMe protocol, uh, much like uh, modern M.2 SSDs do, and it would support legacy SD interface as well for backwards compatibility. So you could boot off of an SD card. Potentially, Potentially. yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that or, I mean, just the, the ability to, because, I mean, these are used so frequently now for, like, really high density, high... So does high, that mean the SD card itself ha is, like, a new wave of SD card? That's oh, yeah. It's NVMe, if it's PCIe supported. Yeah, because, I mean, you, you need, you, I mm. mean, you're, you're still using NAND memory in the SS, in, in the drop, in the SD card itself. And so these will still be those usable need to be fast for cameras to read, and stuff right? like that. Everything like Theoretically, that. Theoretically, yeah. Um... If it's backwards compatibility, then you could potentially have a cart, a, a SD card that comes out like this that you can plug into a, an existing camera that'll read and write at, a, at modern day speeds. But if you were to take it and plug it into, uh, you know, an adapter like this, then it could read and write. Right. What, what what I find interesting about this is that like my own personal experience with SD cards is that I use them for for video when I'm when I'm recording videos for the channel, and. I'm curious to see if capturing it with one of these SD cards, like if the ingestion process would be that much faster through the PCIe interface. It should um, be, yeah. Than than USB because you're you're capped at a much lower um, read and write speed than 880 megabytes per second. I think the so, fastest SD cards right now. Oh yeah, it says right here. You'd be able to U ingest. UHS one goes all the way up to 624 megabytes per second full duplex. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, UHS three. So capturing would would that. be faster with these. Oh yeah, definitely. And it does look like there's a slightly different layout here for the contact points. But then but you'd also have to remove your 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 tempered glass side panel every time you wanted to capture footage. Uh yeah, or maybe or there'd be maybe there'd be or some if there's a pass through or like an adapter. We need a hot swap. Like, we need an M dot two NVMe hot swap in cases now. That's the next thing. Where you can just pop your I could see, like, SD card into a You know, like an expansion spot, slot, a rear expansion slot with a little ribbon that goes over the M.2 slot mm -hmm. or something like that, maybe? Right. I don't know. That's, that's lots of possibilities. Kind of nifty. But yeah, I thought that was kind of fancy. Oh, cool. All right. Uh, speaking of the Mobile World Congress, and there's one more article linked in the description uh, from Storage Review about these new micro SD cards. So a little bit more information on there as well as uh, WD launching some full NVMe SSDs uh, that they have just been working on. So it's good to see Western Digital getting into this space. I know some of their first forays into uh, making SSDs were not that awesome, but um, the PCSN720 
is uh, what they're talking about there. Capacity is up to two terabytes. Sequential reads up to 3,400. Sequential writes up to 2,800. And random reads and writes at 500 and 400,000 IOPS, respectively, which is all pretty nice. Uh, pretty nice fix. So yeah. there you go. Nice. All right. Uh, cool. That's all I have for my regular content for today. So we are going to really Hope quickly read down donation comments. So thanks to all you guys who have donated. Park May, $10. Hashtag gargle your granny. Gargle your granny. Well, I mean, this we can't a... really knock it because we, we invented it. Obviously, so. it's, it's a new sensation sweeping the world. It's my favorite pastime activity. Thank you very much, Park. Ken Hyatt, $12. Recommendation for case to match my Enthu Elite will be NAS Unraid. Need room for EATX, five hard drives, one SSD, thinking Enthu Primo. Thoughts? A case to match your Enthu Elite. What do you mean by matching your Enthu Elite? <laughs> um, if you only need five hard drive trays, I mean... I don't know the the, the 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 new fractal case, the Define R six, has some pretty nice hard drive configuration options, um, and it's it's sleek, it looks looks pretty professional if and stuff. Trying, if you're trying to match an into Elite, then you should that's stick on a with... whole other level, bro. Yeah, um, that's a very interesting question that I'm not exactly sure how. Maybe you should answer. stick I'm not with, sure what you Maybe mean. you should go with the Primo then and stick with Fantex. Yeah, the Primo is great. Yeah. Or the Enthu Pro M is also a fantastic case. Yeah. Any any Fantex case, really. But, um, yeah. Unraid. I'll, I'll probably be using that soon, too. Thank you. Andrew Schweier. Five Canadiers. Here's some money making you two even in donations if you include last week. Thank Plus, you, Andrew. Plus, Paul, you got my last name correct. Pronounce Schweier. Schweier. That's what I said, too. Wait. We have we have excellent pronunciation on this show. Schweier, Schweier. Michael, uh, Levote. Le- 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 it's so simple, but it's tripped us up a little bit. Ten dollar donation. Hey, hey guys, have either of you used in the Pebia X QBER micro ATX slash mini ATX case? And if not, which one would you recommend for around fifty bucks? Thanks. Hmm. Um, I. I'm on the verge of like re-hunting down what my favorite micro ATX cases are right now because I I haven't done a, a build in a while and yeah, and I need too. to reassess that. Right. So I don't have that in my head. Um, but mm-hmm. I do know that the Apevia cases I've worked with in the past have not impressed me. I will say that. You know, I have used one. It's actually the one that I used for my um, best $1,000 PC that you oh. could build. Okay. This was over a year ago, and I had a GTX 1070 in there, which now would run you almost $1,000 yeah. by itself. So that gives gives you some sort of indication of how far back this video was. But I used in the Pevia case that, from what I recall from my testing, had decent thermals for the GPU and CPU. It wasn't the highest quality case, but and it didn't look that great. But there was a lot of airflow going through it, and Air it allowed me and it allowed me to get a GTX 1070 within a one thousand dollar budget. So, so you there know, you go. You're gonna make some compromises there. Uh, Lex Avellino, twenty five dollars. Thanks for commenting on the build. It's actually completely CGI slash three D, as in not real. I made it in Blender. You are a funny guy. Check out my latest tweet to you for screenshots of the model. Unless you're being serious and I thought that your CGI graphics were real. I don't know which system you're talking about. You better check your tweet your tweets then. I will. I can actually find I that. I might have out. complimented you on a completely fictional That'd be PC. Crazy. But thank you very much for the donation. That's very generous of you, Lex. Uh, next up we've got Juan, $10. Juan. Hi guys, started following you two about a year ago when I decided to do my first build. You guys are awesome and have really helped me learn and build my PC. Thanks, and I will definitely be buying some merch. Thank you, Juan. Thanks, Juan. That's awesome. Appreciate it. You're, you're great. You're a great person. You're the best Juan I know. All right. Finally, let's do some uh, shout-outs, some Johnsons, for people who have bought stuff from our stores. Paul. Oh, you bought something from yourself? Same, no, it's not me. Oh. It's Paul H. Uh, also Paul H, though. I was going to uh, say. From New Hampshire, got the Metallic Silver Tri-Blend the Shirt. My, my goodness, people just wanted the bling. Uh, Jason, a.k.a. Bite My Bits. 
Oh, he from Kansas. He he got the uh, metallic silver shirt Bite as well. Thank you. Bits. Thank you. Buy my bits. Bite my I'll bits. Totally, I'll totally bet your bits. Uh, next up is Todd from Pennsylvania. Ted. We got the metallic silver Ted. Heather charcoal lightweight zipper hoodie. Thank you and Johnson to you, Todd. Eric, Eric CPU cooler. Thank you very much, sir. Eric CPU cooler shirt. Josh. Josh. Josh K from Texas. Josh. Thank you so much, Josh. Uh, he got the metallic silver black uh, zipper hoodie and the beer set. Johnson to Thank Patrick. You, Josh. Johnson to Patrick for picking up a BIOS flasher shirt. Glorious. And I have one more from Levy. No, Levi. Sorry. Levi. Levi for picking up a CPU cooler shirt. Thank you very much, Levi Johnson, to you. Kevin B. from Arkansas got the uh, metallic silver Heather lightweight zipper hoodie and the uh, pub glass, the double glass set. Johnson to you and uh, Josh P. from California. Uh, got the metallic silver, also lightweight zipper hoodie. Great, great choice for California. I'm imagining, uh, you know, springtime. It's going to be a, a good springtime. option for you. Uh, Travis R. from Washington. Thank you so much, Travis. And Johnson to you for picking up the uh, gaming desk mat. Uh, you will enjoy it, I think, very much so. All right. Those are all the jo Oh, wait, 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 wait. We got one more. One more. One more. One just, more coming just in. Just came in from Nick. Nick L. from Tennessee. Uh, thumbscrew deckle and the gaming mouse pad as well. The long one. Sweet. All right. All right. That Guys. is going to conclude it for this show, episode 142. No, one. 141. 141. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We do have a raid, a Twitch raid for you guys to, to follow right here. Path of Exile is the game that he's playing. His channel name is E H U D L F G. E H U D looking for group. There's really no. Is that looking for group? Is that L F G? L F G is has. Look, I mean that's in WoW parlance. Of L F G is looking for group. Okay, so E H U D L F G. E H U D L F G. Cell has linked it in chat. Thank you, Cell. Thank for, you, Cell. We haven't said hi and what's up and thanks, Cell, for uh, this this show. As thanks, I Cell. mentioned, thanks, Cell. Uh, he's playing Path of Exile. Show him some love. Tell him we sent you and raid his ass off. In the meantime, he's if you're watching raid. this in the future, hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed this video. Uh, and of course, click the links in the description if you want to read any of the articles we talked about today. Do timestamps for Paul? Uh, timestamps are also lovely and wonderful, and we love you for doing them. And we love you all for watching. And have a wonderful day. Good night. Good night, everyone. <laughs>